be seated. Thank you, team. I might uh, just keep Ben up here with me as I begin. Welcome to church. Has it been a good morning so far? Who enjoyed worship this morning? I did too, yeah. I mean, we're sort of like the white Canadians are like, should I say anything? Should I yell? Should I put my hand up? I enjoyed worship. Thank you, band. Can we just give it up for the worship team really quick? They did such an amazing job this morning. And thank you, Mel. You're awesome. I love your passion. Well, welcome to KCC. Uh, we're doing our Christmas at the movies. Uh, this is our kind of third installment. You've been enjoying these uh, this series so far? Who, who went home last week and watched Elf? Anybody after the service? No one watched Elf? Who likes Elf? That's like my favorite movie. Um, I'm going to be starting a little bit different this morning. Uh, typically we start with a clip, but I'm going to just start with the verse this morning and what I'm talking about. I'm excited to be sharing. Uh, and we're going to be turning to, if you have your Bibles with you, hopefully you do. If you don't, we have it on the screen. We're going to be turning to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. At uh, youth this week, I was preaching on a completely different verse, and I had these verses mixed in my head, and I accidentally had Matthew 5 on the screen for youth, and so they got a different message than they were supposed to, but this week I'm, I'm on uh, time here. Jamin didn't help, he helped me out there. So Matthew 5, Jesus is teaching uh, to a multitude of people. This is called the Sermon on the Mount, if you're familiar with it, and he's talking about uh, the Beatitudes, the attitudes of a Christian, and essentially uh, the character that Christians should uphold or be learning to uphold. Obviously, we're not going to get all these right all the time, but this is something that we strive to do in our life. And so in verse 3, I'm just going to read it for you guys. In verse 3, it says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for, those, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacekeepers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you, when others revile and persecute you under all kinds of utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Then Jesus says this next uh, in this next verse in verse thirteen. This is kind of our theme scripture for this morning. In verse thirteen, uh, and this is really I would say it's it's above a challenge that Jesus gives us. It's more of an identity that Jesus gives us. So I think. There's a lot of challenges in the Bible, and, and Jesus is constantly challenging thinking, but in this statement, he's actually telling us who we are. And so um, you're probably familiar with this. It's, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Someone say, I'm the salt of the earth. I'm salty, not in a bad way, in a good way, okay? I know that term has been loosely used. Uh, but if salt loses its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Then he says, you are the light of the world. Someone say, I'm the light of the world. Like you mean it. I'm the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, people's, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket or they put it on a stand. That's where that song comes from, this little light of mine. Remember that, Remember that song? Anybody? Sunday school? Yes. I'm going to let it shine. Right? I'm not going to sing it for you. It's okay. Maybe Pastor Dave will sing it for us later. I'm sure he loves to sing. So, But they put it on a stand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I'm just going to pray for us this morning. Could we just bow our heads uh, this morning, I'm just going to pray that we receive something from this word today. Father, I just thank you so much for who you are. And God, we just, uh, we humbly come before you today. God, we want to hear your voice today. We want to learn from you today, and we want to learn from your scripture. God, would you just uh, soften our hearts in this moment? God, any preconceived notions that we have this morning, any thoughts that we're thinking of that are not from you, God, we just want to fix our eyes on you today. 
We fix our hearts on you today. And God, would you cause us to grow deeper and deeper in relationship with you and deeper and deeper in relationship with each other. In Jesus' name, if you agree, somebody say amen. Amen. Well, we're going to get into the movie. Thank you, Ben. Uh, We just have a few clips for you this morning, so enjoy.
I don't. I, I watched this movie a lot, and I don't remember it being that brutal. <laughs> like even Santa, he's kind of a jerk, right? But uh, I don't know if <laughs> this movie is. Uh, it brings back a lot of memories. I don't know if it did for you this morning, or maybe that was your first time, and you're like, "What the heck are we watching right now?" Um, but I remember, you know, simply when I was younger, this was kind of, this was like the only thing CBC would play because it was, you know, one of three channels. Anybody in the three channel club when you were growing up? Some of you were like, you had three channels, we had one, right? But this movie would like, every time December would roll around, it was either like the Charlie Brown Christmas. That was like, that was like if you were lucky, you caught that one because that was the best movie. And then it was this one that was like replayed all the time. And, uh, and I remember, I remember like looking at this movie and it kind of reminds me of like when you have like a fever and you're like dreaming crazy dreams, like a fever dream. I don't know if like that's like something for you, but this movie, uh, it's interesting. It was released in 1964. So I don't know if anybody remembers that year. Anybody here? I'm not trying to age you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, definitely before I was born. But, uh, you know, it's funny because Carol, Carol had messaged me when I was... Uh, uh, preparing for this, and she's like, this movie took like almost two years to make, and it's, I think it's like 50 minutes total, that's like an average Netflix TV show episode now, but it took two years because it's all stop motion, so really incredible uh, animation for its time, and if you ever, if you watched Elf, you would understand like, they took a lot of, you know, obviously like parts of this and like the costumes and uh, even the snowmans in the first part of Elf, so really interesting, but here we have Rudolph, and if you're familiar, obviously, with this movie, you know kind of what happens. But uh, right off the get-go, he's forced to fit in, right? He's, he's told even by his, like, like he, he speaks out first. Like, his first words are, you know, Papa, Mama, and they don't even care. They just see his nose, right? They're immediately, he's told to, like, hey, you need to change this. We need to hide this. We need you to conform. You know, don't be who you're supposed to be. You know, conform to what we think is acceptable, what Santa thinks is acceptable. You know, you better fit in or you won't be accepted, right? And how many know, like, this is very applicable to the world we live in right now. Like, how relevant is this movie to, to all the stuff that we kind of walk through in our day-to-day and I have uh, just a, an analogy this morning, and I and I did I did warn him, but I do have this like T-shirt, and I need uh, I need Aaron to come up here because he's much bigger than me. Why don't we just welcome Aaron? <laughs> bigger as in more muscular. Okay, that's what I mean. But uh, I need you to I need you to put this on, <laughs> or attempt to put this on. Okay, KCC kids, a little shout out if you want to be a part of the kids. Ministry, yes, that's what you get to wear. But uh, Aaron's going to be trying this on. And as you can see, from the get-go, we already know, and if you can't get it on, it's okay, like, but he's going to try. He's going to try. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Oh, he got it on. Wow. All right. So it's basically like a sports bra for men. Hey, look at that. But uh, you want to just, just for a minute, it's Okay. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to buy him lunch after church. Okay, so obviously, obviously, we can see this. The shirt was not designed for Aaron, right? This shirt was. It fits a little bit differently than it would maybe like Caden or something, right? It's probably designed more for Caden's size. But this this really represents kind of like what happened to Rudolph, right? He's immediately told, "Hey, like put this on, even though it's not com- like there's more things that are more important than comfort, right? Like self respect, Aaron, right? You can take it off. You can take it off. Thank you. Give it. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, you can you can keep it, right? But. As Aaron's walking away, right, like that's, that's kind of what happens, right? We, <laughs> he's still trying to get it off. All right, everyone leave Aaron alone. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Now I owe you like twice, okay? But I, I feel like as we grow up and, and obviously maybe like as we grow up through school, like that's kind of what happens to us. We, you know, we're, we're told to put these things on that don't really fit us. If it's like a, like a behavior or, you know, you, you try to act a certain way to fit into a certain friend group or, you know, it's a personality trait that you try on and it doesn't really fit and everyone can kind of see that it doesn't fit you. Uh, and or, or you, know, you know, maybe it's an opinion of someone else's that you have to like, you don't want to be the person that stands out of the crowd, so you change what you think, but you try on something that doesn't necessarily 
fit you. And when we try to put these things on, obviously they don't look great, right? They don't look good, but we try. We try to put them on. We try to wear them as best we can. So, you know, we fit into the crowd and we're all wearing men's sports bras, <laughs> right? Shirts that are too small for us, right? But I think if we could just kind of reel it back in just for a second, I have to reel myself back in. Um, I think, you know, obviously, I think every single person can say at some point in their life, maybe, maybe it's now, maybe it was when you were younger, maybe you're going through it personally, that we've experienced that kind of pressure. Anybody in the room, the, the pressure to try to conform, the pressure to try to fit in to what the world thinks is acceptable. Anybody been there before? Right? And I think especially, especially when it comes to us as Christians, right, as, as, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to live a certain way, correct? We're called to live unashamed of the gospel. Or as we read in Matthew 5, Jesus, again, he didn't challenge us to do this. He said, you are the salt of the earth, right? He gives, he gives a identity. You are the light of the world. This is how you're supposed to live because we went through the Beatitudes. He, he talks about Christian character. And so the moment we... We try to fit on these other things that the world tries to say is acceptable. We start to look like Aaron in a really small t-shirt. We're like, hey, we don't really fit in this role. We don't really fit in over here because we kind of look goofy. And, uh, and I think that as a Christian, we're supposed to stand out, if that makes sense. We're supposed to stick out of the crowd, right? Um, but when, what ends up happening, and I think far too often... I think far too often um, we've tried to essentially shove Christianity into either a box or a, like a gift basket and kind of like present it to the world the way that culture would say this is acceptable, right? I think, I think far too often it's happened where we've, um, even in I feel like the last like 10, 15 years where we've tried to make Christianity cool or we've tried to make Christianity like, relevant or we've tried our best to like try to make Christianity flashy, if that makes sense. And, and when it, it's usually when the pressure to conform comes that we're, we're trying to do those things. We're trying to like present it as this something that's not. Does that make sense? And, uh, and I think especially when it comes to our own life, when pressure comes to us to conform and, uh, you know, opinions uh, of others, you know, say like, well, it's like they want our opinion only if it's a certain opinion, right? They would, they would come to us and say, well, we want you to say this. We want you to be like this. We want you to be like that. Otherwise, we're not going to accept you. And I think when push comes to shove, we have this survival instinct in all of us. And I would say that it's, it's, it's okay because it, it's, it's not like we're trying to do this, but we, we often will hide, right? We'll often you know, shrink back. We'll often, you know, we'll try to not stick out in the crowd. We're like, well, I don't really agree with that opinion, but I don't really want to like ruffle the feathers of everyone around me. And so we try to like, we sink back in a sense to where we're not like living the way that Jesus has called us. And I'm not saying that Jesus is saying like kick down doors and like shout the gospel at everyone until you're blue in the face. That's not what I'm saying. But in doing so, in, 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 in the way that we hide so that we don't get, you know, canceled, right, by culture, we, we essentially will lose our saltiness. Does that make sense? Like if we, we are, we're not living the way that we're, we're called to do and we're, we're almost like hiding, we're losing that thing that Jesus has called us to do. And what Jesus says in Matthew 5 is if salt loses its saltiness, it's what? Garbage. It's worthless. And it's kind of harsh to say. It's like Jesus said it, right? He's saying, hey, like if you don't, if you're not salty, if you're not salting the world, and I'm going to explain what salt means if, if that term is kind of weirding you out, but like if we don't do that, we're losing our saltiness. If we hide and constrict ourselves, we put on things that don't belong on us, we lose our saltiness. Or as, as we saw in, in Rudolph where we hide our light or our light kind of gets snuffed out, we become dim, dull Christians. You guys with me? Is this Okay. We're meant to stick out in the crowd. I believe that Christianity is supposed to be attractive. It's supposed to be attractive. But there's a difference between Christianity being attractive and Christianity fitting in. Because fitting in is someone else's standard of acceptance. Where, where the, the gospel itself is supposed to be attractive, right? It's called the good news because there's bad news. Right? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good news if there wasn't bad news, and so Christianity is supposed to be 
attractive. It's supposed to attract. It's not supposed to try and fit in. Does that make sense? And it's really, it's really about the character of it. There's one thing that we do need to remember, and I think it's, it's really important when it comes to reading Scripture, that, uh, and it's really important for me to remember that God's word does not conform to me. Right? God's worm, word, word, worm. God's word does not conform to me. It doesn't conform to my political views. It doesn't conform to my opinion. It doesn't conform to somewhat, sometimes I have delusional truths, right? It, it doesn't conform to me. It, 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 the Bible actually states, and Paul says this in Romans 12, that we are to be not, not conformed by this world, but be transformed. We are to conform to what the word of God says. Amen? It, 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 be, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do I renew my mind? By reading his word. Right? And that's why it's so important when we, when we come to Scripture and we, we approach God's word that we come humbly. Because I think it's really easy to come to Scripture with this like preconceived notion of what we think it means. And we, we can get it wrong, but if we, we come into to that space and we say, God, I need my mind changed, <laughs> right? God I, God, I need my heart humbled in this moment. Uh, you know, God, break my pride as I'm trying to wrestle through this scripture. God, break my entitlement. Break the standard that I have built and build your standard in me. And when we, when we come to scripture, we have to come with that way. And, and uh, I'll be honest, sometimes I struggle with some scriptures in the Bible, I've struggled, I've wrestled, I'm sure, Pastor David, you've probably, it's, it's a wrestle that we have to make, and, and it's not like I'm deconstructing my faith, and I think that's a, that's a popular thing going on right now, where uh, there's this, like, deconstruction of faith, but their deconstruction of faith is not, like, repainting the walls, right? Pastor Bodie was talking about this in staff meeting, there's this, this idea of deconstructing, is like, rip the, rip the foundation out, burn the house down, and we need to do it our own way, but that's, that's an issue, because we're taking something that was built over thousands and thousands of years, the foundational truths of the Bible. There's this popular argument that, you know, even, even myself, I've, I've made this, uh, you know, growing up as, uh, you know, a young, <laughs> immature Christian in high school, not really knowing which way to go. But I remember I would use this argument to justify, you know, doing certain things or justify me, you know, sinning or justify me just being in those spaces where I shouldn't be, where they would say like, well, Jesus hung around sinners, Right? Jesus hung around, he went to where they were. So that means, you know, I got to go to where the sinners are. I got to go to the clubs. I got to be a witness in the club, right? Like I got to, you know, that's literally what I would do. And, and I've heard this argument being made where it's like Jesus hung out with sinners, so I need to be where the sinners are, right? And I think that's a, it's a misinterpretation of Scripture because the idea is they're using this argument, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm telling on myself because I've used it just to fit in to the crowd, where I've used Jesus as a way to fit into a crowd or to conform myself to not being like a lame Christian, if that makes sense. And I think, yes, there's, there's truth to this statement. Jesus went to where sinners were. He hung out, you know, if you want to say he hung out with sinners. But what ended up happening is, is Jesus wasn't there to help them feel good about their sin. He wasn't there to justify their sin Ultimately, what happened to those people is they left wanting to be more like him, right? And what, ha what ends up happening, and this is not every single situation, but most often when we, when we have that idea of like conforming our Christianity into like what the world accepts or we're quote unquote hanging out with sinners to, to help ourselves feel better about whatever we're going through. Whenever, uh, what, when, the, when that ends up happening is we end up becoming more like them, if that makes sense, right? And, and, and we, we want to be, I'm using a lot of quotation marks, okay, sorry, but we want to be loving by not saying anything, right? But there's a difference between what true love is and what, you know, Christianity is told to be. Because I think that what, what it's told to be is that you say, well, you're not a loving Christian if you don't accept this, 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 this. 
But in reality, me loving you is saying, is, is first, Rebecca said this uh, in a, we had a dinner with a few friends of ours, and she said, you have to get to the heart to be able to get to the face, to get in the face. Was it, was it? Get to the heart to be in the face, right? To be in their face. You, got, you guys get it, right? You have, to, you have to build a bridge to someone's heart to be able to actually confront somebody. Because if, if me not saying anything and just being like, I just love you for whatever you're doing. And, you know, I'm not going to say anything because I'm, quote, unquote, loving this person. But I have to get into their heart. And then I can, I, then I can actually confront that person with the truth. Right? And and. Hanging out with sinners is, is not going to the clubs and say, hey, I want to come to your house. I want to have a, like, let's talk. Let's, I want to hear about your life story. That's how you get into their hearts. You actually have to, to not, not go where they are, but bring them to a place where it's like, sit down for coffee with somebody, right? And, and actually, like, love them that way. But, like, tell me your story, you know, and, and find out who they are and, and how they think. And, and then you can start to actually go through the heart to get to their face and say, hey, and you can confront them with biblical truth. And that's, that's what loving is. And, and, and here's, a, here's my point is Jesus didn't go to Matthew, the tax collector's house, to, you know, fit in with the crowd. He didn't go there to just tick off the Pharisees. He didn't go there to help them feel good. He says this, when he's confronted by uh, the Pharisees, they say, hey, how come you're hanging out with these people? He said, I came not for the healthy, but for the sick. So Jesus not only goes into those spaces, he doesn't just go into those spaces naive, but he goes in with mission, right? He knows exactly what he's there to do. He, he, he says in, uh, in John 8, 12, he says, Jesus says this about himself. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so Jesus goes into those spaces to expose the darkness and to call people out of that darkness and into his light. Is that, is that good? And now Jesus, it's, it's really cool because he says, I'm the light of the world, but now he calls you the light of the world. He calls us not to just walk in light, but to bear his light. Back in Matthew 5, where Jesus calls us the salt and the light of the world, again, Jesus isn't challenging us to become something. He's giving us an identity, right? He's saying, hey, you are the salt, and you are the light. It's a given responsibility, and I think that it puts so much more weight on this statement. And I just want to quickly talk about, like, what, you know, what, what would salt and light mean in, in, in the context of what Jesus is talking about? What's the significance of salt? And, uh, and obviously, if you've ever read any portions of Scripture before, Jesus loves to use kind of everyday items uh, for analogies. And salt being one of them was, was used for a lot of things. Like, like culturally and historically, it was used to make like leather, all these different things. But I would say in this context, mainly, there's two kind of applications for us today. And the first is, uh, you know, salt was a preserving uh, material. It preserved meat, right? It kept it from rotting. It, it slowed Decay, And so what I believe that Jesus is telling his disciples is they have to have a preserving influence in culture. Have a preserving influence in culture. Salt is the opposite of corruption, right? So, so I think that in this he's saying preserving, like we're preserving all these, these little things that we're doing throughout their day. We're bringing out the good. We're standing for good. And I believe that in this application, really, Jesus is talking about our character, right? What's, what's on the inside? What's actually, what's actually holding it all together? Uh, another quote from Rebecca. She has just great quotes. If you ever want to talk to her, she's got a lot of wisdom in her. But she said this. I don't know if she actually, like, this is from her, but this is something that she really, like, lives by, carries with her. If you ever met her, you'd know this. But she's, uh, she said, your capability to do something will get you into the room. But your character is what's going to keep you there. Your capability is going to get you into the room. But your character is what's going to hold you there. And I believe that, that application, that salt, right, it, it, it's preserves from the inside. We have to be careful of our hearts, our character. Your character will keep you there. The second thing that salt uh, was used for was flavoring. Right? Anybody a salt fan? Yeah? Come on, everybody. 
If you ever had chips with no salt, they're, they're awful, right? <laughs> salt makes, it's, it's so simple. Salt makes food taste better. It, it, it serves our food. It, it brings out the best in food. It, it makes something bland, not so bland, right? And so in the same way, Jesus, I believe he's calling, he's calling us as disciples to be the flavor of the earth, right? To, to add flavor to things that would otherwise be bland, right? Our day-to-day lives, how many can agree with? Sometimes it can be bland, right? Especially if we're walking with our heads down and just the Monday to Friday grind and just try to get to the weekend. But when, when Jesus is talking about this to be the salt, to be the added flavor, he's not saying like wear a flamboyant suit and walk around like sprinkling candy at people. Like that's not flavor. He's just saying, hey, you need to, you need to realize who you are in those spaces and bring out the good, Right? That's what salt does. It brings out the best in an ordinary substance. It br- brings out blessing in every single day lives. It, it brings out blessing in bad situations where we can see through uh, opposition. We can see through like the mountain. We say, no, like my God is with me. And, and walk through our days with that kind of like that, that viewpoint in mind. Does that make sense? Where we're walking with flavor and we're drawing life out of dead places. Amen? The second thing is light. He talks about how we are the light of the world. Very simply, you know, without light, it would be dark, right? If we just, if, got, if I got Steve to just hit all the lights off in here, we just shut off all the lights. Well, we don't need to do it, but I mean, if you want to, we could. And then everyone try to get up and like switch seats, right? Like it would be absolute chaos. He started dimming it for me. But... Without light, it would be what? Dark, right? And we would be bumping into things. Like, we would probably wouldn't want to move around too much. Like, trust me, we've had youth events in the dark. Lots of injuries, okay? Um, but the purpose of light is simply this, to dispel the darkness. It, uh, it illuminates the darkness and exposes what's there. To, to shed light on a situation is to what? Bring truth to it. To shed light on a dark situation is to bring the truth into that situation. Uh, it enables people to see what they're doing. And so in a sense, light can bring, you know, correction. Light can bring clarity. And I think ultimately, light can bring hope to people in dark spaces. The second thing light can do is it'll bring guidance right? Especially to those uh, in, in, you know, in John 12 or 8, 12, he says, I, have, I, I am the light and I, I'm calling people out of the darkness to bring them home. Light can bring, it brings guidance to you in dark spaces. And that's why God's word uh, is, it's, it's talked about like a light, like a lamp unto my feet, right? And it's, and it's kind of like the, the picture is like an old rickety lamp and you can't really see very far, but we can see kind of like that next step, right? That's where trusting in God comes into place, where his word is a lamp, his word is a light unto our feet. And then the, the kind of the third thing that it can do is it exposes the darkness in me, right? God's truth, that's why, that's why I talked about um, God's word can't and it won't conform to me. I have to conform to it. And that's why when I go to God's word, it can expose those dark areas in me, right? And it, and it, and it almost like, it's like, it's like it, it brings me back to a place of reality. It brings me back to a place of life. And, and sometimes those moments can be really hard and really frustrating. Uh, Rebecca got the, the, the taste of this when I think we were walking around Save On it. And I was like, I was struggling all day with this scripture. I was literally doing studies on it and studies on it. And there's like, if you look on the internet for anything, you'll find like uh, opposition for something and like opposition for another thing at two angles where you, you, you're trying to find the meaning of scripture. And there's all these different different people like saying what they think it means and I'm struggling. I'm like, who's right? Right? Like who's right on this situation? And, and we have to, we have to go to his word again, humbly and willing to change. Jesus calls us the light of the world, not to just be light receivers, but light givers. Where salt speaks of that inner man, that character, 
that, that, that part of us that's against, it, it's against corruption. And light is that outward expression of how we live. And if, uh, if we jump back to Rudolph, I guess we're wondering when we're going to go back to Rudolph. But if we, if we go back to Rudolph, we see uh, it's kind of a sad situation, right? He's, uh, he's, a, he's rejected by not only his friends, his family, uh, his co-workers. The whole community is kind of rejected in him. He's walking away and uh, his co-workers, I know. Uh, <laughs> But he's rejected by this community, and um, he kind of goes on this, like, self-discovery. He meets a, I won't, I won't I can explain the whole story. I'll, I would encourage you to watch it. It's free on YouTube, by the way, uh, if you want to watch it. But he runs into this elf who, who pops out of the snow, and this elf has also been rejected by the elf community for wanting to be a dentist, God forbid. Kind of relates to, Brody, you wanted to be a dentist, right? Yeah. How dare you? Um, but Rudolph, he goes on this kind of self-discovery, uh, and he's, he's lighting the way with his nose the whole way. I know it's super cheesy, but uh, uh, eventually he finds himself, and this is where the, the clip is going to be, he finds himself coming back to Santa's workshop, and this blizzard has kind of run in, and Christmas is about to be canceled, so here we are with this final clip. I think it's really funny how, you know, at the end of this show, and obviously, like, we can see the ignorance of Santa, but, you know, forgive him. It's not so great sometimes, but uh, it's funny that, you know, Rudolph's nose never changed, right? He didn't try and he actually rejected conformity at the beginning of the movie. And along the way, he just was trying to be, you know, who he was supposed to be. And at the end of it, we can see that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't adjust the brightness of his nose. He can't really do that. He doesn't hide it. Uh, he just continued to use it as, you know, what it was intended to do, to shine in dark places and to help out, you know, the, the toys on Misfit Island, right? And eventually it would, it would lead to Santa changing, right? He changes his disposition towards... Uh, obviously Rudolph that he could actually utilize this nose to see through the darkness and I know that um, this is really cheesy application for us but I think there's so much truth in this movie um, and it's and it's very relevant to you know how our world is right now if I'm honest but again it's it's coming back to our character 
right? It's coming back to what Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 3 to 12. How I live my life, right? How I live my day to day, my choices day to day, how I, how I talk, the things I say. And this is kind of, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through uh, a few of these in, in Matthew 3.11. And I would encourage you to, to do the same later on this week. Maybe if you're reading through these, to just do your own study. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. But Jesus lays out some of the characteristics that we're supposed to walk in. And, uh, and I believe it's, it's, really, it's really well worded. And, and if you look through these and, and how it's structured, he starts out with this. Uh, and I believe this is the, the place that we should all be starting and kind of alluding back to uh, how we approach Scripture. But he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And whenever I would read that, especially growing up, I, I didn't really like understood it. I was like, am I supposed to be like, like broke? Am I supposed to be poor? Right. But that's not exactly what it means. And, and it's not to say that I'm supposed to have no value in myself, but really being poor in spirit is assessing yourself and saying, I am nothing without Christ. Right. And that's where we all need to start. It's, it's a moment of humility. It's like my, my spirit is poor until Christ fills me. And only Christ can fill me. And that's where uh, humility starts. It's, the second is this, it's blessed are those who mourn. And again, kind of confusing, but when we look at this, it's, he's talking about those who mourn are, are those whose hearts break and are broken for the lost. And the fact that sin is in the world where we, we mourn over the brokenness, we mourn over the loss. And this, is, this, this comes through prayer. This comes through getting on our hands and knees and praying and, and letting, letting that, that, that sadness. That's, that's a good type of sadness where it's like my heart breaks for those who don't know Christ. My heart breaks for those who are confused in this insane world that's pushing an agenda it, it breaks, it has to break in those spaces. The third one that I want to highlight is uh, blessed are the meek. And meek doesn't mean weak, right? You can write that down and start a, you know, whatever. You can post that on Instagram. But meek doesn't need, doesn't mean weak. It's not, it's not being a pushover. I think there's a misconception about, you know, obviously, meek Christians are pushovers or we're supposed to, you know, there's this verse in the Bible where it's like, turn the other cheek if someone slaps you, right? Like, okay, well, I'll just present my other, you know, and we're supposed to just like roll over and be this kind of weak kind of, you know, whatever, but that's not, a, that's nothing to do with being meek and that's nothing to do with what uh, Christianity is. Uh, being meek is having strength under control having strength under control. If you've ever, uh, you know, ridden a horse, anybody ridden a horse before? It's absolutely terrifying, okay? I have a, I have a, like a fear of horses because I've seen, you know, people get bucked off them, but you ride a horse and it's like, you can feel the strength in that, in that horse. Like they are solid muscle and they could hurt you, right? They could do some serious damage, but it's, but being meek is like being trained a stallion being trained to do a job instead of running wild, right? And that means for us, like having that strength under control, we are being, we're capable and our character is capable, but we have to be someone who's strong, but willing to submit under authority for a greater purpose. And uh, again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you see this is kind of like, Jesus laid out the answer for us on these characteristics that we should be achieve, trying to achieve. And when we come to it all, he says, he gives us that identity, that little like, that boost. He's like, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Pursue these. You are the, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And obviously, not gonna get it right all the time. I'm not gonna get it 100% all the time. But I, I can't, be in a space where I'm shying away from it any longer. We can't be in those spaces, even if it comes to criticism, even if it comes to rejection, to where we have to walk out these things. And it doesn't mean, again, that I'm going to like shove the Bible down someone's throat who doesn't agree with me. That's not what I'm saying. But I, but I can't be in a position where I'm compromising my calling. We can't be in those positions. 
honestly, truly believe if we begin to walk this out, opportunities will come. Right? When, when you have character, sometimes it's like people are thrown off by it. When you, when you have integrity, sometimes people are like jealous of that. But when we, when we choose to actually walk those things out and we walk uh, guided by God and we walk guided by his Holy Spirit and sometimes we might have uh, an unpopular decision to make that the world would think is unpopular, but I guarantee you there's gonna come a day where doors are gonna open for you because you continue to walk in the way that God was calling you to walk. And that's what I believe is so important. And, and, and I wouldn't say it's, it's missing, but there's definitely a lack. And I would say more and more and more, we need to have people of Christian character in, in businesses and in workplaces and in, in schools and every act of life where we can actually have people that will walk with integrity and walk with that salt and walk with that flavor and, and, and not to shine so that we can shine and we can look good, but it's all for the glory of God. I think the last thing that I want to say is we need to take Jesus at his word. We need to believe the word of God. We need to believe that when Jesus gives us that identity, that we can walk in it, right? And it might feel scary be like, Jesus referred to himself as the light of the world, and that was Jesus. I'm Malachi, and I screw up a lot. How am I supposed to walk this out? But we need to, we need to shelf those insecurities when we, when we take this in, and we need to actually believe what the Word of God says, that Jesus says you are the salt and the light of the world, and we walk those things out. I believe that when we do that, when we truly believe, when we truly just say, God, I'm going to grasp onto that, that he's not going to leave us high and dry, and he's going to guide us through. I just want to pray for you this morning. Can we just bow our heads and, uh, and close our eyes? Father God, I just, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you for this goofy cartoon that we can grab an analogy out of. God, it's so relevant to what we are walking through in this world. But God, I pray ultimately this morning we would grasp onto your word that you called us to be the salt of the earth. You called us to be the light bearers, God, that you've called us into action. You've given us a roadmap. You haven't left us high and dry, but God, this morning, we want to grasp on to what you said. We hold on tightly to your word, God. And this morning, would you just, even in this moment, God, would you speak to each and every person's heart whether we're dealing with insecurity, whether we're dealing with shame, whether we're dealing with a broken heart, whether we're dealing with frustration, whether we're dealing with anger, whether we're dealing with pride, God, would you just come in this moment right now? Just come in this moment, Holy Spirit, come in this moment. Begin to relieve those feelings. And God, replace it with confidence in you. That we want to walk poor in spirit. God, to where we're not relying on ourselves for the outcome. We're not looking to our own strength. But God, we, we walk in humility where we're nothing without you. And God, we believe that when you pour out your spirit into us, that we have, we have, we can have confidence. We can walk in you. God, we want to be meek people, not weak people, but meek people, willing to submit to who you are, willing to submit to the authority that you've you've given. God, help us to walk this road humbly before you. God, ultimately, would you just continue to, to challenge our hearts? God, so we can walk in character. We can walk in these attitudes, these characteristics that you've given us, God, in Matthew 5. To where we can be the flavor, God. We can bring the blessing out 
in bad days, God. We can be that person that people are gonna go to when they don't know what else to do. Not because we're the savior, but because we know the answer and we can point them to you. And God, let us be a light, especially in this Christmas season where it's so dark and darkness is trying to come in. But God, we just want to shine your light and God, help us to daily, as we go to our jobs, as we go into our schools, God, that we would just have that just ingrained into our brain that we are light, we are your light, and we are meant to shine it forth. God, remind us daily. Remind us, don't let us forget. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, if you agree, someone just say amen this morning. Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us today at KCC. I want to bless you uh, as you go and pray that you have an amazing, you know, Sunday and, uh, you know, go France in the World Cup. Go France. Yes. Anybody? No? Okay. That's okay. Sorry if you're an English fan, but uh, bless you. Have an awesome day. We love you. We'll see you next week and uh, enjoy your Sunday.